special report. Today, we deal with the greatest mystery in the history of the United States, who killed President John F. Kennedy. We'll be looking at some photographic evidence which serious researchers believe proves that his death resulted from a conspiracy. Only 46 years old at the time of his death, Kennedy was the youngest American president. He was also the first president born in the century. He represented a youthful, more flexible outlook on the world and our society. The people loved his style. They loved his attempts to avoid war through negotiation and his initiatives in the areas of civil rights and social programs. But the young president had more than his fair share of enemies, most of them right here at home. Organized crime bosses were plotting against his life because of the crime-busting efforts of his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Politicians were fearful of his attacks on the status quo, and the military and attendant intelligence agencies were angry over Kennedy's lack of aggressiveness during the Bay of Pigs invasion and the subsequent Cuban Missile Crisis. In the fall of 1963, Kennedy had angered military leaders by announcing that he was withdrawing all U.S. military personnel from South Vietnam. In the midst of these tensions between the young president and the American establishment, Kennedy made a political fence-mending trip to Texas. On November the 22nd, 1963, while he was riding in a motorcade in downtown Dallas, shots rang out in a small park area known as Dealey Plaza. Kennedy was rushed to a nearby hospital, but was declared dead shortly after 1 p.m., and events moved rapidly after that. In the minutes following the president's death, Virtually the entire nation sat in shock by their radios and television sets to hear details of the tragedy. Lyndon Baines Johnson was sworn in as the 36th president, and the Dallas police stunned the world by apprehending a suspect within two hours of the shooting death of both Kennedy and Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett. That suspect's name was Lee Harvey Oswald, and within hours the media was filled with an astonishing wealth of information about him. An ex-Marine who had attempted to defect to Russia, Oswald was immediately labeled as a loner and a malcontent. Police quickly produced an abundance of evidence, including a rifle found in the Texas School Book Depository, a building overlooking Dealey Plaza. They traced that rifle to a Dallas post office box used by Oswald. The Dallas District Attorney proclaimed an open and shut case against Oswald, who insisted he was innocent. The suspect told newsmen, I'm just a patsy. And it was 10 months later that a government commission created by President Johnson reported that Oswald was in fact Kennedy's lone assassin and that there was no conspiracy. And the American people accepted this conclusion because they had already been conditioned to accept Oswald's guilt. In February of 1964, Life magazine had published on its cover a most incriminating photograph of Oswald holding a rifle and wearing a pistol in his belt. The caption accompanying that picture bluntly stated, Lee Oswald with the weapons he used to kill President Kennedy and Officer Tippett. Yet this was seven months before the Warren Commission announced their conclusion of Oswald's guilt. But was this photo a fake? Well, one assassination researcher and graphics expert has spent more than two decades studying this picture which he claims to be a clever forgery used to incriminate Oswald. That expert is Jack White of Fort Worth, Texas. Let me show you the results of my photo analysis and see if you too can detect the graphics blunders which prove that a powerful conspiracy resulted in the death of President Kennedy. The photograph in question was one of two allegedly found by Dallas police investigating President Kennedy's murder. How did this picture suddenly turn up on the most influential magazine in America? The leak of this important piece of evidence is certainly mysterious. Now, Life originally was offered that photo by an anonymous donor, but ended up paying Oswald's wife, Marina, less than $5,000 for a copy of the original. But at least two other copies of that picture quickly were made public. They were published across the country by the Associated Press. Although it seems apparent that these photocopies were leaked by the authorities sworn to uphold the law, there was no official criticism of this unorthodox treatment of material assassination evidence. And what about the man pictured with the rifle in this photo? Well, according to Warren Commission documents, Oswald was shown the photograph while being questioned by Dallas homicide captain Will Fritz. 
Now, Fritz reported that Oswald said the picture was not his. The face was his face, but that the picture had been made by somebody who superimposed his face on somebody else's body. The other part of the picture, he said, was not him at all, and he'd never seen that picture before. So, the authorities said that the incriminating photograph was proof of Oswald's guilt. Oswald, on the other hand, claims the picture is some sort of a fake with his face pasted on somebody else's body. Now, if in fact that photograph is a cleverly contrived fake, there must be much more to Kennedy's assassination than simply a lone, misguided assassin. This concern is even voiced by G. Robert Blakey, the chief counsel of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. That committee looked into the Kennedy assassination in the late 1970s. Blakey has stated, if they are invalid, how they were produced poses far-reaching questions in the area of conspiracy, for they invent a high degree of technical sophistication that would almost necessarily raise the possibility that more than private parties conspired not only to kill the president, but to make Oswald a patsy. Someone other than private individuals conspired to kill the president? Well, obviously, these backyard photographs now take on much greater significance than previously believed. For instance, did Oswald's wife actually take the photograph as the government claims? Or was it carefully constructed in some sophisticated graphics laboratory, as Oswald himself suggests? To try and answer these questions, we've studied every aspect of those backyard photographs, and we've now confirmed the rather startling information brought to our attention by Mr. White. Reporter Dan Foster is standing by with some details on just where those pictures were discovered. Dan? Craig, behind me is 2515 West 5th in Irving, a suburb west of Dallas. In the fall of 1963, Oswald's wife was staying here with Ruth Payne. Although he had a rented room in Dallas, Oswald himself stayed here the night before the assassination. And it was here on the day following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy that police claimed they discovered two pictures of Oswald with a rifle, despite the fact they had searched the home carefully the day before. This one, Warren Commission Exhibit 133A, is the most famous. It was used on the cover of Life magazine. This is Exhibit 133B, supposedly another pose taken only moments from 133A. While officially only these two photos and the negative to 133B were found among Oswald's belongings in the Payne's garage, Dallas Detective Gus Rose told the Warren Commission he found two negatives. To further confuse the issue, two separate listings of Oswald's possessions confiscated by Dallas police failed to mention these most incriminating photographs. Furthermore, an intensive search of Oswald's possessions failed to turn up either the black shirt or dark pants seen in the photographs. And these were not the only discrepancies concerning these photos. Oswald's mother, Marguerite, told the Warren Commission that on the night of the assassination, Marina showed her a picture of Oswald in the backyard holding a rifle over his head. At her insistence, the incriminating photo was burned and flushed down a toilet. Mrs. Oswald could have been confused over when she saw the picture or what pose it depicted, but there's no confusion about this third backyard photo. This third photo, which has never been officially explained, was discovered in 1976 by the Senate Intelligence Committee. It was in the hands of the widow of Dallas policeman Roscoe White. White's son made headlines by claiming his father was one of three assassins firing at Kennedy and Dealey Plaza. At least some Dallas policemen must have been aware of the existence of this third photo. Here is a detective recreating one of the backyard photos for the Warren Commission. We see that the pose used by the Dallas police to recreate the backyard photo in 1964 is the same pose of the third picture which has never been accounted for and was suppressed for nearly 15 years. Some months ago, I learned of yet another issue which raises more questions about the discovery of these photos. 
The issue of the origin of these photographs becomes even stranger when we consider the statements of Robert and Patricia Hester, who worked long hours at the National Photo Lab in Dallas the evening of the Kennedy assassination. They were processing film and photographs for the FBI and Secret Service. With me is Jim Mars, a news reporter in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex for nearly two decades and has taught a course on the assassination at the University of Texas at Arlington since the mid-1970s. Jim, you've spoken with both the Hesters, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Unfortunately, they're both dead now. I first interviewed Robert Hester in the late 1970s. He told me he saw the backyard photos in the hands of the FBI the night of the assassination. He was quite insistent on this fact. Of course, that's the day before the photos officially were discovered. In later years, his wife, Pat, confirmed this story and told me and other Texas researchers that the FBI even had a color transparency of one of the photos, as well as a picture of Oswald's backyard, but with no one in the picture. They were very certain about all this. It's very strange. Thank you, Jim. We'll be talking with you more a little later. To add to the mystery, yet another version of the backyard picture of Oswald was discovered in 1967. This picture, similar to the one used on Life's cover, was found by Dallas oil geologist George de Morenshield, who was described by the Warren Commission as Oswald's last known close friend. De Morenshield discovered the picture among his stored possessions upon his return to the U.S. from a lengthy stay in Haiti. That was long after the assassination. This photo contains more background image on the outer edges of the picture than the original print police claim to have found. It also shows finer detail, evidence that this photo was made with a high quality camera, not at all like Oswald's cheap imperial reflex. While there's been no official explanation for this De Shield photo, it's been assumed it's a copy of backyard photo 133A. Yet this could not be, since the detail of the DeMoran Shield photo is so much better than 133A, and it contains more background than the original. It appears that the DeMoran Shield photo itself is a composite picture made up of 133A and the border of the film plane aperture of Oswald's camera. To add to the mystery, the DeMoran Shield photo has an inscription on the back, reading, Hunter of Fascist, ha ha ha. This odd inscription was first written lightly in pencil, then traced in ink. Handwriting experts have determined that the handwriting does not belong to Oswald, or his wife, or even George de Morenshield. In a strange twist of fate, de Morenshield, a Russian nobleman by birth, was close friends of Jackie Kennedy's parents, and also of Oswald, the man accused of murdering her husband. The DeMoran Shields have said they believe the photograph was planted in their possession to further fix the idea of Oswald's guilt in the public's mind. Thanks a lot, Dan. I want to return to you in just a moment, but first, let's just go back a bit. In order to establish the real origin of those backyard photographs, we begin with the camera used to make them. This is an Imperial Reflex camera. It's a poor quality camera, handheld, and normally you hold it at waist level and view scenes by looking down into the top viewfinder. Now, reportedly, this camera belonged to Lee Harvey Oswald, who by all accounts was quite interested in photography. Yet, very few photos made with this camera were actually found after the assassination, other than those two incriminating backyard pictures. Now, this camera was allegedly discovered in the Payne home by Oswald's brother Robert on December the 8th, 1963. That was two weeks after the assassination and after several intensive police searches of that home. When the FBI did get the camera in February of 1964, it wasn't working. And Marina was unable to identify it as belonging to her husband. Later, however, in 1964, apparently after being coached by government lawyers, Marina changed her story. She said it was, in fact, the camera used to make Oswald's picture. Now, Dan's standing by in Dallas to tell us the official version of just how those photographs were made. Dan? Craig, it was here in the small backyard of this two-story frame house at 214 West Neely Street that the incriminating photos were supposedly made in the spring of 1963. 
The Warren Commission determined that the pictures were made on Sunday afternoon, March 31st of 1963. But there's a problem with that. While the photos show a bright sunny day with deep shadows, the Dallas office of the U.S. Weather Bureau reported that March 31st was cloudy with traces of rain all day. Marina's accounts of her picture-taking session here in the backyard changed several times while testifying to the Warren Commission. First, she couldn't recall taking any pictures. Then she remembered taking only one. Recalled by the Commission and shown both pictures, she agreeably stated that she may have taken two, but only two. Of course, it is now known that a third such photograph exists. According to Marina's testimony, the photo session only took a few minutes. Marina said about noon on that Sunday she was hanging out clothes when she saw Lee come downstairs from their apartment dressed all in black. He carried a rifle and was wearing a revolver on his hip. Marina laughed to see her husband dressed so outrageously. Lee didn't laugh. Take my picture, he said. Marina begged off, saying she didn't know how to take a picture. Lee said he would set it all up and all she had to do was push a button. She reluctantly agreed and Lee arranged the camera settings, handed the camera to Marina and struck a pose. Click one photo was made. Lee walked over and took the camera. He advanced the film and handed it back. Walking back, he struck yet another pose. Click. A second photo was made, and the session was over. Lee returned to the house, and Marina returned to her wash, puzzling over the odd incident. But did this actually happen? Oswald claimed he had never seen the pictures before. Marina has been unclear about the incident from the beginning and could not identify the camera early on, nor be certain as to how many photos were actually taken. Today, she says she did take three photos, but a fourth is known to have existed. It's all very strange, Craig. Strange indeed. Now remember, Oswald himself told police that the picture was a fake. And Captain Fritz reported Oswald denied ever seeing that picture. And Oswald told Fritz that he understood photography very well and that in time he would be able to show that it was not his picture, that it had been made by somebody else. Of course, Lee Harvey Oswald never had the chance to prove his claim that that incriminating picture was a composite fake. He was shot and killed by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby two days after the assassination in the basement of the Dallas police station while being escorted to a car handcuffed between two policemen. But while time ran out for Oswald, others have taken up the challenge. Over the years, Jack White and other assassination researchers have diligently studied the backyard photographs, and their findings are very shocking. We return now to Dan for a detailed account of Mr. White's research. Craig, I'm here in the office of Jack White, a graphics expert in Fort Worth, Texas. Mr. White has studied the JFK assassination case since the day it happened, and as a photographic consultant, Jack presented some of his graphic analysis to the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the late 1970s. Mr. White, what got you interested in the assassination case? Well, Dan, I've worked in graphic arts since uh, graduating from TCU in 1949. At the time of the assassination, I was vice president and executive art director of the largest advertising agency in Fort Worth. I read uh, Oswald's comments about the backyard photos and how they were fakes, and I decided to check it out for myself. And what have you found from your studies? Well, Dan, I obtained uh, good quality prints of the backyard photos from the National Archives back in the early 70s. Since then, I've studied them extensively. Along with other researchers, I've found many things about these photos which make me highly suspicious of them. There are many aspects which seem to point to fabrication. You mean the pictures may have been faked somehow? Yes, exactly. I would especially point to problems with the body of the figure in the photograph, the rifle, the telescopic sight, Oswald's face, the picture's backgrounds. Let me explain. And explain he did. 
Here's what White and other researchers have discovered about the famous photograph. We'll start with the figure in the incriminating backyard pictures. Notice the odd leaning posture of the figure in the photograph. When this picture is printed backwards, the lean becomes even more pronounced. Mr. White's studies indicate that the figure's center of gravity lie outside its weight-bearing foot, a physical impossibility. Then there are problems with the figure's proportions. Here are the two photos reportedly found in the Payne garage. The most famous one, the one on the left, is known as the Warren Commission Exhibit 133A. The other is 133B. Notice that while the figures in these photos have been brought to the same size and the red lines mark the position of the knees and head, the figure in 133A appears to have a larger head, but a smaller body than 133B. 133B, on the other hand, seems to have a smaller head, yet the body appears larger, especially since the feet reach outside the picture indicating that the figure is closer to the camera. Here we see the figure's knees and toes in the same place. Yet the figure on the right appears to be about six inches shorter than the one on the left. Notice too that the shadows of the figures in the photos fall in different directions, although reportedly the two pictures were made within seconds of each other. 133A's shadow is in a 10 o'clock position while 133B's shadow is more in a 12 o'clock position. In what we call 133C, the third photograph only discovered 13 years after the assassination, White pointed out that the figure's shadow again falls in the 10 o'clock position. But while the figure seems to be in the same position, the shadow reaches up the fence in the background, yet appears to be cast by a figure which is much shorter. In 133A, White noticed the upper left arm was much too short and the elbow abnormally high, perhaps as much as six to eight inches above the waist. In this photo, there is simply a hand gripping the rifle. In dozens of tests trying to recreate this picture, no one has been able to duplicate this unnatural posture. Here, White has taken the backyard photo, 133A, and matched it with a reconstruction of the picture. He made this comparison overlay with 133A and a photo of a man striking a similar pose. After matching the size of the rifles in both pictures, White noticed that one shoulder is much lower than the other. If the right shoulder, arm, and rifle all matched up, you would expect the left shoulder and arm to also match, but it doesn't. Further evidence of possible sloppy touch-up work on this picture is here in this blow-up of 133A. Notice the fingers on the left hand appear normal, slender fingers with clearly defined fingernails. But on the right hand, the fingertips appear to be missing. There's no sign of fingernails on these stubby fingers. Mr. White also noticed a wristwatch on the figure's left wrist. Oddly enough, however, no one recalled Lee Oswald owning such a watch, and no wristwatch was found among his possessions, either at his rooming house or at the Payne home. In addition to problems with body shapes and a vanishing wristwatch, researchers have found problems with the rifle. The Warren Commission puzzled assassination researchers by publishing this ad, which it stated was a duplicate of the magazine ad from which Oswald reportedly ordered a rifle. Why show the public a duplicate when the original ad was readily available, researchers asked. Later investigation showed that the February 1963 ad, supposedly used by Oswald, offered a 36-inch rifle. The rifle now in the National Archives, identified as the assassination weapon, is 40 inches long. To hide this discrepancy, the government panel simply published a later ad which indeed advertised a 40-inch rifle. This discrepancy in rifle length is mirrored in discrepancies discovered by White. 
He found that when the figure in photograph 133A was blown up to match Oswald's known height of five foot nine inches, the length of the rifle was entirely too long. And when the rifles were brought to the same size, matching its official 40.2 inch length, Oswald appears six inches too short. But an even stranger problem exists with the rifle's telescopic scope. White discovered that in 133A, the clearest and most famous of the backyard photos, the rear end of the scope appears to be missing. He even found wrinkles in the pants where the end of the scope should be. Mr. White concluded that this was solid evidence that the photo was doctored in some way. But the evidence of shortened arms, stubby fingers, and distorted rifles pales next to what White and others discovered about Oswald's face. Remember that Oswald told Dallas police that someone had pasted his head onto the incriminating picture. Over the years, assassination researchers, beginning with Fred Newcomb of California, noticed that while Oswald's chin in the backyard photo is broad and flat, other pictures, such as this official Dallas police mugshot, show Oswald had a sharp cleft chin. Today, all researchers agree with Oswald that the backyard picture indicates some sort of photographic chin transplant. The idea that Oswald's face was grafted onto the incriminating photo is reinforced by the discovery of a line which interrupts the continuity of the photographic grain. This line stretches from one side of the neck under the lower lip to the other side of the neck. Could this indicate the point where Oswald's upper face was spliced onto another body? A panel of government photo analysts lamely tried to explain away this anomaly as water spots on the negative. One panel member even said it may have been a line of pimples. But Mr. White did not rest his conclusion solely on an odd line of pimples. Here he has made a red transparency of 133B. And here is a blue transparency of 133A, the other original backyard photo. Supposedly, these are two separate pictures taken moments apart after moving the camera around while advancing the film. If they're laid on top of each other, nothing in either photo should match identically. Yet incredibly, we find that nothing indeed matches except for Oswald's face. His face in this overlay is purple indicating that the red and blue transparencies match precisely at that point. This identical matching of faces is considered impossible with a handheld camera taking a series of photographs. Mr. White and others see it as further confirmation that Oswald's face was pasted over another photo. Then there is the added problem of shadows on the face and neck. We have already seen that problems exist with the direction of the body shadows on the ground in the backyard photos. Mr. White points out that in the first picture, a V-shaped shadow falls under Oswald's nose, seeming to confirm his wife's statement that the photos were made about noon with the sun high in the sky. Yet on the next photo, the V-shaped shadow remains identical despite the fact that Oswald's head has tilted to the left. Also notice that while the shadow under the nose indicates a sun directly above, there's a heavy shadow on the right side of his neck and sunlight on the left, indicating light from yet another direction. Mr. White reported inconsistencies with shadows throughout the backyard photos. Here in 133B, we see sunlight coming from the figure's left throwing shadows well to the right rear as evidenced by the shadow of the rifle barrel on the stairway post. Yet we see a patch of light on the right side of his neck, which should be in shadow, and the V-shaped shadow under his nose remains the same. Oswald's neck in the backyard photos presents other problems besides shadows. Here, in 133A, a slight bulge can be detected on the left side of his neck. Oddly enough, this unexplained bulge is not seen on the neck in 133B. 
but a similar slight bulge can be found in the shadow of the stairway post several feet to the rear of the figure. After making careful measurements of Oswald's neck using the formula circumference equals pi times the diameter, White compared this to these official police mug shots. The one on the left was made in Dallas, while the one on the right is from New Orleans. White concluded that both police mug shots depicted Oswald with a collar size of about 14 and a half inches. But the backyard photo depicts Oswald with a collar size of more than 16 inches. It should be noted that all of the shirts found in Oswald's possessions were of medium size, the 14 to 15 inch collar range. White claimed this is yet another sign that the backyard photos are fraudulent composites. But if the Oswald figure and face in these pictures raise questions about their authenticity, the backgrounds pose even stranger problems. At first glance, both of the original backyard photos, 133A and 133B, appear to have a background photographed from slightly different perspectives. But these apparent differences are simply the result of cropping or framing the pictures according to Mr. White. By cutting off the bottom of the background in one photo while cutting off the top in the other, a false perspective is achieved. By bringing both original photos into alignment as shown here, we find that the background of the photos, the grass, bush, stairs, fence, and house next door, all appear to be identical. In 133A, a green triangle points to a patch of sunlight on the side of the house behind the post holding the stairway. This highlight has not changed shape in 133B, indicating the camera making the photo could not have changed positions horizontally. Here, a red arrow points to the edge of the roof on the house next door. This too remains unchanged in 133B, indicating that the camera never moved up and down. Each red dot represents an identical point in the background of these two supposedly separate photographs. Shadows on the stairs and fence, leaves on the bush, and blades of grass all appear to match perfectly. This sameness of backgrounds in two separate photographs is possible in only two situations. One is that the camera was resting on a heavy tripod which never moved between frames, or that a single backyard scene was used as a background for two composite photographs. Of course, the official version of the taking of these two photos has it that Oswald's wife used a cheap handheld camera. She has specifically denied using a tripod. On the basis of these inconsistencies, anomalies, and the evidence of retouching, I believe that these incriminating backyard photographs, highly publicized as proof of Oswald's guilt, are nothing more than cleverly constructed composite forgeries. Fakes. And Jack White is not alone in this charge that the incriminating photos are fakes. Major John Pickard, a photographic expert with the Canadian Defense Department, has stated publicly that the backyard pictures have the earmarks of being faked. He too called attention to the conflicting shadows and the perfect match of the Oswald faces. Another expert, Detective Superintendent Malcolm Thompson, a past president of the Institute of Incorporated Photographers in England, also has branded these pictures as fakes. Thompson said he felt the incriminating photos were the result of a montage of separate pictures. Another noted British photographic authority, Geoffrey Crawley, seen here with White in London, studied White's work and said it was as thorough and as accurate as any he had ever encountered. Well, strong evidence indeed that the incriminating pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald and his weapons were faked in some sophisticated laboratory. That someone set out to deliberately fabricate evidence against Oswald. But what about the two official investigations of the United States government? What do they have to say about these questions raised by Mr. White and other researchers? The Warren Commission of 1964 and the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1979, after giving opposing conclusions about President Kennedy's death, closed up shop 
leaving no one to answer these vital questions. All we are left with is their official reports. Dan? The Warren Commission concluded the photos were genuine. This was based on the testimony of FBI photographic expert Lyndall L. Shaneyfeld. Shaneyfeld said that the negative to photo 133B could be shown to have come from the Imperial Reflex camera reported to have belonged to Oswald. This was based on markings on the negative which matched markings in the camera. Shaneyfeld said since the two photos appeared to be taken at identical times and places, it was his opinion that the two pictures were not composites. However, Shaneyfeld also said he could not positively identify the rifle in the photos as the same rifle held by the FBI as the assassination weapon. Apparently, in an attempt to resolve the problem of the conflicting shadows, Shaneyfeld presented the commission a photograph of an FBI man recreating the backyard pose of Oswald. Taken in bright sunlight with a body shadow which matched the one in the photo, this official photo might have settled the question of whether or not the Oswald neck and nose shadows might be duplicated naturally. Oddly enough, the FBI cut off the man's head in their photo, leaving the question still open. Shaneyfeld explained that he cropped the agent's head because he didn't feel it was pertinent. In the late 1970s, the House Select Committee on Assassinations was created by Congress to review the evidence in the deaths of both President Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This official panel did little better than the Warren Commission in determining the truth of these assassinations. Faced with acoustical evidence of a second gunman in Dealey Plaza, the House Committee grudgingly admitted that Kennedy probably died as the result of a conspiracy. In an attempt to resolve the dispute over the legitimacy of the backyard photographs, committee experts turned to a system of measuring and comparing minute distances in photos known as the Penrose Distance Statistics. They endeavored to prove the size and shape of Oswald's facial characteristics were identical in several different photos of him, including the backyard snapshots. Using complicated mathematical formulas which match the Penrose system measurements with the backyard photos and other pictures of Oswald, the committee experts concluded that there were no biological inconsistencies in the photos to support the idea that anyone other than Lee Harvey Oswald was pictured. In other words, these government hired experts asserted that the man in the backyard photos is definitely Oswald because his feature measurements matched other shots of Oswald. These paid experts also concluded that the backyard photos were genuine by studying identifying marks made by the camera's film plane edge on the negative of 133B. After comparing scratches on the 133B negative to other film exposed through the Imperial Reflex camera, they were able to conclude that the markings matched, therefore indicating that the 133B negative indeed came from the camera reportedly belonging to Oswald. Evidence enough for them that the photos are genuine. The government experts also concluded that there was no fakery involved in the backyard photos by closely studying Oswald's mouth in the two original pictures. By looking closely at an overlay of the two pictures, it was noted that in one photo Oswald is slightly smiling and in the other, he is slightly frowning. Two expressions, two separate photos. They also discovered minute differences in measurements of details in the background of these two photos. The roof line in one did not quite match in the other. The fence posts did not match precisely. Again, such differences, no matter how slight, supported the idea that these were separate photographs and this seemed to invalidate the idea that they were composite fakes. Well, it seems like we're right back where we started. Government-hired photography experts maintain that the incriminating backyard photos are exactly what they appear to be. Separate pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald with a rifle, which at least appears similar to the one said to have killed President Kennedy. Dan, just how did Jack White respond to the findings of the House Committee? Craig, things aren't always as simple as the experts make them seem. Mr. White offered us a strong rebuttal to the conclusions of the government experts. 
In reporting the results of the Penrose measurements of Oswald's facial characteristics, it seems the House committee was less than honest. Note in this comparison chart of Oswald photos published in an appendix to the committee's report. Three measurements have been left out. These three just happen to include the same areas of suspicion raised by Jack White, namely Oswald's nose length, earlobes, and most significantly his chin. White said if these three missing measurements have been added to the Penrose study, it most likely would have revised the numbers to the extent that a conclusion that all of the Oswald photos were identical in facial features would not have been possible, especially considering the controversy over the shape of Oswald's chin. So the committee chose to simply delete the troublesome figures. The conclusion that the one backyard photo negative could be traced to the Imperial reflex camera is even easier to explain, according to White. He said the ballistics type evidence of markings on the negative which matched markings made by the Imperial reflex camera can be explained two ways. One method would simply be to acquire the Imperial reflex camera, keep in mind it was not found until some time after the assassination. White said an exposure could have been made through the camera which would show nothing but the markings on the edge of the negative. This fabricated negative edge, when combined with a fake backyard photo, would have resulted in a negative of the faked picture with the negative markings traceable to the Imperial reflex camera. However, Mr. White said another way to achieve the same effect would be simply to build a composite picture using one backyard background, add a figure with a rifle, then Oswald's face and photocopy the whole thing with the Imperial reflex camera. Mr. White also pointed out to us that this backyard photograph discovered by the De Morne Shields years after the assassination has a black border indicating it was produced from the entire original negative. Yet the negative reportedly was never found and has never been made public. Mr. White said this is evidence that this photo was somehow produced without the Imperial reflex camera negative. This photo was produced with a high quality camera with high resolution power for fine detail, indicating that the backyard photos could have been made prior to being photographed by the inferior Imperial reflex camera. That explanation was understandable enough. I then asked Mr. White to explain how Oswald could have two different expressions if the photos were faked and there was actually only one face. He demonstrated that the only difference between the two original photos was in the area of Oswald's mouth. He explained that a clever retouch artist could have turned Oswald's mouth down with the stroke of a brush. Jack, what makes you think this was done? Well, I've done similar things with retouching over the years. I've worked in advertising, so I know how simple it is to accomplish this. Also, after studying this matter for some time, I realized that it's physically impossible to change one's expression from a smile to a frown without moving the muscles throughout the entire face. Try it yourself sometime in the bathroom mirror. Just see if you can change from a smile to a frown without moving any part of your face but your mouth. It's impossible. But even Mr. White was puzzled for a time by some of the apparent differences in the background of the photos. Frankly, I was confounded at these small differences. I had long ago come to the conclusion based on years of study that the backyard photographs were composites and that only one true picture of the Neely Street backyard had been used. But I could not explain what seemed to be slight differences in measurements and perspective between the two photos. Then I discovered that photograph 133A seemed to have a slight downward perspective as if the camera had been pointing down while 133B seems to have an upward perspective although the parallel lines of the stairway posts and the garage indicate no vertical perspective. You have to understand perspective. Artists and photographers are familiar with terms such as horizon lines and vanishing points. Notice how from this perspective my thumb covers a photo on the wall behind me. Notice what happens when the camera moves just slightly. You get a totally different perspective. You can demonstrate this for yourself by holding out one thumb and closing one eye. When you open the closed eye, you get a different perspective. It all has to do with the perspective of the viewer, in this case, the camera. 
I found that 133B did seem to have a stretch in perspective, but only in one direction. So I began to experiment in the darkroom with the 133A print in the easel stand and the 133 negative in my enlarger. I was familiar with the process known as keystoning, which is a darkroom technique to introduce a false perspective to a one-dimensional photograph. By simply tilting the easel under the enlarger, it makes the resulting photograph appear to have a slightly different perspective. This was the single most thrilling moment of my investigation because when I tilted the easel, the backgrounds came into perfect alignment, proving that the two backgrounds of the backyard photographs were identical. I had reversed the process of whoever made the composite photographs. I had proved to myself that they were nothing more than clever fakes concocted in some dark room somewhere using sophisticated graphic and photographic techniques. In my investigation of the backyard photographs, I had hoped to answer some questions about their origin and authenticity. Now there are more questions than ever. If they are fakes, as I feel I have demonstrated, then who produced them? Why they were produced is obvious enough, to incriminate Oswald as a presidential assassin. But who had the ability to produce such forgeries? It seems to me they must have been made prior to the assassination, and this means someone other than Oswald had prior knowledge of what was about to happen. It also seems reasonable to conclude that these fakes were produced in a sophisticated facility with all of the equipment necessary for the techniques used. Therefore, I conclude that these backyard photographs, important evidence, are fakes. We must remember that Mr. White's conclusions of fakery have been echoed by foreign photographic experts in Canada and England. Now let's return to Jim Mars and hear his thoughts on this issue. I think I speak for many people who have studied the assassination when I thank Jack White and the many others who have made such a painstaking study of the backyard photographs. It appears obvious to most researchers that serious questions remain regarding the authenticity of these photographs despite the pronouncements of government experts. I need not remind the audience of the many instances that the government pronouncements have proven false. And in this case, I'm afraid that in recent years, certain people within the federal government have become suspect in Kennedy's unsolved murder. In the coming years, it'll be up to the citizens of the United States to look beyond the official pronouncements regarding Kennedy's assassination and view the available evidence for themselves. So, there you have it. Do you believe the conclusions of government experts that the backyard photos are genuine and evidence of the guilt of Lee Harvey Oswald? Or do you believe the research by Jack White and others which throws grave doubt on the legitimacy of this evidence? Was this photograph used to incriminate Lee Harvey Oswald a fake? The decision's up to you. Until next time, I'm Craig Maurer saying thank you for joining us for this special report. If you'd like to learn more about the conspiracy that resulted in the assassination of President Kennedy, read Crossfire, The Plot That Killed Kennedy by Jim Mars. It covers every aspect of that tragic event. Crossfire, The Plot That Killed Kennedy, available at your local bookstore.